Good evening, everybody. This is the regular meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, April 10th, 2023 at 7 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Ellis. Here. Member Hannes. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchick. Here. Member Weiner. Here. Member Hughes. Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed at the basket over there on the table to my right. I have allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment. All right, let's please rise. Uh, we're going to welcome Bel Air School to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome. Uh, Brent Porschel, the principal at Bel Air. Super happy to be here and excited to share some of the fantastic work that we've been up to this year over at our school. I'm happy to introduce our two student council advisors or our, our supervisors. We have Mrs. Stanton and Ms. Wiest. Good evening, my name is Ms. Weiss and I'm one of the staff advisors for this year's student council. My name is Mrs. Stanton, I am also a staff advisor for student council. We are super excited to show you what different activities we have implemented at Bel Air throughout the year. First off, let's introduce our student council members. Hi, my name is Thomas and I am student council president. Hi, my name is Brendan and I'm student council treasurer. Hi, my name is Jackson and I'm Student Council Secretary. Hi, my name is Hazel and I'm Student Council Spirit Chair. We are, we are the Bel Air Bulldogs. We are now going to present our different activities we have done each month. In October, our school participated in Red Ribbon Week. This year, we reminded us the importance of staying drug free. Here's our flyer we sent out to all students and staff members. We also put red ribbons on the trees outside of our school. In November, we did a variety of different school-wide activities. We created a school-wide thankful chain. Every student in, in the school got a strip of paper and wrote what they are thankful for. Then the student council members and advisors made a huge chain to hang up in one of our main hallways. We also wrote cards to veterans for Veterans Day to show our appreciation. We sent the cards to a veteran's home in LaSalle, Illinois, where Mrs. Stanton's grandpa lived. We received a thank you letter from the veteran's home saying how much the veterans loved our cards. Lastly, in November, we had a fundraiser called Change for the Community. This fundraiser raised money to help families in our community to have food for Thanksgiving. We raised a total of $323. Here are pictures of our thankful chain, our change for community flyer, and the thank you letter we received from the Veterans Home. In December, we started a giving tree for our school. The giving tree helped families to have food supplies for winter break, such as microwavable cups, cereal boxes, and other shelf-stable products. We also had a winter spirit week to lead up to winter break. In addition to our spirit week, we held a winter workshop on during lunch, we sold a variety of winter-themed items, such as pencils, bookmarks, stamps, bracelets, and erasers. We raised $461. All of our proceeds went to families in need during the holiday season. Here are some pictures of the student council conducting our winter workshop fundraisers along with different flyers we sent out for our December activities. In January, we created a, an activity called School-Wide Snowflakes. We wanted to stress the importance of that everyone is unique and special just like a snowflake. Each student re received a snowflake and wrote what makes them unique. They got it to decorate their snowflakes however they wanted. We hung up the snowflakes in our main hallway for everyone to see when they walked by. In February, since our winter workshop was such a success, we decided to have a Valentine's workshop as well. This workshop was running the week leading up to Valentine's Day. We sold similar items as the previous workshop, but Valentine's Day theme. We raised $243. All proceeds went towards new recess equipment for all grade levels. We also had a spirit we called the Great Kindness Challenge. 
This reminded students how important it is to all our people. Last week, we held a fundraiser called Soups for the Super Bowl. Students donated different canned goods to families in need. We had two different boxes to put our donations in marked Eagles and Chiefs. Students got to put their canned items in the box of which team they wanted to win the Super Bowl. Here are pictures of the flyers we sent to each student as well as the student council during our Valentine's workshop. In March, we had an activity called School-Wide Shamrocks. Similar to the School-Wide Snowflakes, each student received a shamrock and wrote why they were loved. The students got to decorate their shamrock however they wanted. We hung up all the shamrocks in our hallway to see. We had a spirit week to lead up to spring break. Along with our spring spirit art week, we had a school-wide readathon where all classes can have 30 minutes of reading or listening to stories. Here are pictures of our school-wide shamrocks and our spirit week flyer. Thank you so much for listening to the different ways we make Bel Air. We've been very busy this year. Um, the student council has been doing a great job of keep, keeping our students involved, providing a variety of activities, and really supporting our positive psychology and Orange Frog. Next up, I'd like to introduce our PTA president, Mrs. Beth Green. Thank you, Brent. Hi, I'm Beth Green, the PTA president this year. We're very excited to bring back some of our um, favorite programs and events that we've had in the past, now that we're free to. We had a um, family color run this fall and a nice uh, parent-only trivia night in, these, in the wintertime. And we're excited to be in our third year of our birthday banner. With a donation, the banner is placed in your yard on your student's birthday, and it's really fun to see that travel around the neighborhood. It really increases our sense of community amongst ourselves in our different Bel Air areas. We're excited to go back out on field trips. We'll be taking our first of fourth grade students to the theater and our five, six downtown to see the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, so that's really exciting. Our lunch book club this year was revamped. We partnered with the Downers Grove Library and its networked libraries to get more modern books for our students to keep them engaged in reading. And we just finished off some of those clubs and they're really excited and asking if they can read more books. We recently had an Irish dancers assembly as well and some of our own Bel Air students were the performers. That was a really fun day. Upcoming events, we have our book and puzzle exchange, which encourages students to reuse and recycle. They'll donate their old materials and they'll take home something that's new to them. And any excess that we collect is donated to Scarce. We're gonna have our students perform for their peers in our variety show for the first time in many years. Some of these students will be their first time performing. It'll be really exciting. And then at the end of the year, when we celebrate our sixth grade breakfast, we'll have our staff, our families, and our students all gathering to reminisce and really share their Bel Air experience before we head them off to <coughs> Herrick. There are a variety of ways that Bel Air School PTA uh, supports our students and staff. Our book fair supports our LRC, but we also have a birthday book club where with a donation, the students get to pick a book from a variety of choices that our library teacher provides and then they get their name put in the cover of that book and they get to be the first student to check it out. It's a really fun way to help support our library and keep the kids reading. In addition to having some goodies for Staff Appreciation Week, we try to get our students very much involved. They'll wear teachers' favorite colors and sports teams and write special notes to our staff so we can shower them with our appreciation for the hard work they do all year to really help our students grow. We have, in addition to just a classroom teacher supply fund, we also set aside a little discretionary fund for the staff to get together and see what they think is gonna benefit the school for equipment or materials that they all can share and use together. So thank you very much for letting me come and share some things that's going on with PTA. Great, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Beth. So our PTA has been up and active once again this year, and it's great to have some of those programs back like uh, Beth had mentioned. Next up, I wanted to give an update on how Bel Air is doing according to our school improvement plan. But before we jumped into our goals, I wanted to talk about some of the points of pride that we have uh, up and running over at our school. Um, it's great to have our buddies and our safety patrol back up and, and going this year. That really does encourage and promote and really provide a strong structure for cross grade level collaboration between our older students and our younger students. A real uh, good opportunity for leadership and mentorship and uh, a good support for our younger students also. With our district moving towards some common language and discipline and, and behavior, I really wanted to make sure that our, our staff had a solid understanding of restorative practice 
of growth mindset. And so we used two different resources this year. One that we had in place prior to the pandemic district-wide, which was Discipline with Dignity. And also this year we introduced Hacking School Discipline. Through our strong conversations and discussions through our professional learning Mondays and through some of our faculty meetings, we really were able to discover and look at the difference between expectations and values and also between consequences and punishments. As a result of that great work that we did as a staff, we were able to come up with common expectations for all of the different environments within our school. Uh, on the slide there, you can see that I have the one for recess, but we also have one for classrooms, for restroom, for lunchroom, for common areas like our hallways. And while the values remain the same of be respectful, be responsible, and be safe, the expectations will have some subtle differences depending on what the environment is. We do, we do have different ways of uh, providing some student recognition also. Uh, one of the ways you can see up there is our, our bulldog brag board. Um, we do have a kindness tree that's in our hallway also. Both of those really recognizing students who are showing some of those be respectful, be responsible, be safe uh, values throughout the different parts of our school and throughout the school day. And we even have a couple of classrooms who are focused on different character traits or characteristics from a one month or a two month uh, progression. At the end of that one month or that two month, really what those classroom teachers are doing is finding a couple of students in each classroom that have really, really focused on those characteristics and, and shown those on a consistent basis. We're really proud of our student involvement and student involvement when it comes to our clubs, um, after school programs, and our community partnerships continue to be really strong. The Park District, of course, and the Fire Department and the Police Department, but we're also focused on Ag in the Classroom. Um, we have our township providing some instruction for our students in, in terms of SEL. Um, another example would be executive functioning. Some of our students had their artwork displayed in our local legislator's office in, in uh, Lombard, which was absolutely cool for our students to, to see. And we're also, again, this year partnering with the Morton Arboretum through their tree restoration program. We have 16 more trees being delivered to Bel Air for planting next month, so we're really excited for that opportunity as well. In terms of our growth, um, what you see up here is our uh, spring of 2022 IAR results, uh, green being expected growth, so we're, we're hitting that in ELA. Math is showing up as blue, which is higher than expected growth, which is absolutely awesome. Just like we've done in the past, after every benchmark, we are taking a look with our instructional leadership team and with our grade level teams also um, at each of our, our, our grade levels different outcomes for the benchmark, or in this case, the IAR. And we dig in a little bit deeper to find out what kind of support is needed either for the core, for small groups, or for individual students. And looking at our ELA for IAR specifically, uh, we wanted to do some watering in that area, and so we dove into those scores and quickly realized that it was our written expression scores that needed some support. And so we didn't waste any time in, in gathering some of that support from our resource teachers um, and from our instructional coach. And what we were able to do is have a number of classrooms at this point and grade levels having gone through a coaching cycle, which was focused on incorporating specific strategies for writing, depending on what the student, what the student need was at each different grade level. We've also been able to capture some of our materials from the writing committee. We have two classrooms currently going through um, our ELA pilots or our writing pilots. And one of the resources that we used um, specifically for our strategies was the writing rope. We didn't want to ignore our younger grades either. And so for them, what we've done is incorporate some actual typing skills um, via an app. We, what we didn't want to do is have a student, when they get to the IAR, um, be limited with a lack of typing skills themselves and have that limit their ability to get their, their thoughts down on the computer or on the device that they're using for the IAR. But that's also gonna help them be successful in the classroom as well. Another area that we've been focusing on, specifically in our grades four through six, is the higher level abstract comprehension skills in terms of reading, whether it be informative text or fiction. Um, what we've been doing is making use of Bloom's Taxonomy and some resources from Fontes and Pinnell as well to, because, to give us some of those stronger upper level question strands to have students make connections between text <coughs> and characters. Um, and that's been doing a nice job as you can see here. This is our map growth from our winter benchmark. Math is on the top this time, um, but that has remained strong in blue. Reading continues to be green, but if you, were look, if you were to look back at our past percentage, you can see that that's actually gone up. We anticipate that continuing a forward trend as we hit our spring benchmark in May, and we're currently in our IAR benchmarks right now with a couple of more days to go. 
Our third school improvement goal was focused on the positive psychology in Orange Frog. You can see through our student council, they've really embraced that with our two advisors. Um, the students have participated in, in various activities through that. Um, our staff is really engaged in this, and the staff has participated in mostly a monthly group activity uh, for them to experience, um, to facilitate, and we've really recognized not just staff themselves, but also some of our support staff, including bus drivers, custodians, nurses, who sometimes don't get that same recognition as a classroom teacher. But that continues to be strong. We have three more teachers going through the training uh, this coming summer, so thank you for hosting that once again. It really is something beneficial and positive for us all. Thank you again for the opportunity to have us in here this evening to share some of the great things that we're doing and to show some of the highlights that we're so proud of over at Bel Air. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. And for our student council members, we have, we have some gifts for you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Good job, kids. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, you, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up on the agenda is, a, um, is some communication. Listed on tonight's agenda are five communications received by the board. Are there any additional communications a board member would like to share at this time? <clears throat> All right, then we're going to go on to our spotlight. So we're going to be uh, looking at an update from the district equity leadership team. Welcome, uh, Mr. Sissel. Thank you. So tonight, um, we want to just sort of do a follow-up uh, presentation, and then if there are any questions, comments, or discussion from the board, from where we were in November when we presented the initial uh, work of the District Equity Leadership Team and, and the initial findings of the Equity Audit. So as a reminder, the District Equity Leadership Team, or DELT, was formed as we began the Equity Audit process. Initially, they, they did a needs assessment of the district, and they've been meeting uh, last year and this year, really working to continue to build background in all of these areas and also to be the group of people who really kind of dissected and read through every piece of information we've received with regard to equity from both the audit and the ISB equity journey continuum. Many of these are slides that I'm kind of refreshing from November just because this is something we want to keep at the forefront as we begin these conversations. So just a reminder, but I'll, I'll go through them relatively quickly. Equity is, is something that we talk about for many reasons. Some of them are, are state-led and some of them are local. First of all, it's in the ISB strategic plan, as we talked about in November, and so a few different spots on the screen where you would see this appear in the Illinois State Board of Education's planning. We also have two board policies that specifically mention equity and, and a culture free of bias, and so there are policy 610, which is listed here, and policy 710, which is listed here. Our current strategic plan also has a couple of areas that specifically use the word equity or equitable. And again, we know that we've been talking about subgroup data and those kinds of things. And we do know that occasionally we hear experiences from different families, students, current students, former students that, that share some experiences that give us a, a good opportunity and a, and a good intent to take a look at ensuring that experiences for all of our families continue to be equitable and aligned with educational equity. So last November, this was one of the last slides on the screen, which was really what the DELT was intending to do and the work that was intending to take place over the course of the rest of the year. So developing that clear language and definition around what we mean when we are talking about educational equity, communicating that and kind of continuing the learning around it, and then continuing some of the, the findings and, and analysis of both the audit and the continuum to, to get us to some more tangible next steps. And so really I want tonight's presentation to take the format of kind of looking at where we've come since November in those areas. First of all, we did spend some time developing 
um, a statement around educational equity. And we initially were calling it a definition, but the truth is defining educational equity is likely not able to be condensed well into a few sentences. And so the first parent group that we brought this to was the Curriculum Council, which has parents and administrators and teachers, and, and their, their response was maybe this is more of a, of a commitment statement or, or something along those lines. And so at any rate, the words on the screen right now are, are the work of, of a few hours of wordsmithing and conversation and, and a lot of work by the DELT. A lot of this is rooted in both District 58's current vision statement and ISBE's statements on equity. So that's really where the language came from. So without going through this word for word, this was really one of the first sort of tangible outcomes that the DELT was, was proud to put forward. As we worked through that, and this is another slide that we showed in November, just a reminder that the work we're doing as it's defined is about ensuring access and ensuring welcoming safe environments. It's not elimination of things. It's not intended to be divisive or political or any of those things. And again, based on the findings and the information we have, we don't anticipate drastic changes to educational programming from an equity lens. We anticipate continuing to look at all areas in District 58 through an equity lens. This was an example that's actually in the, obviously you're aware, the, the entire audit is, almost, is just over 200 pages. Early in the introduction, the, the DELT really found this example to be intriguing and something that we thought would be interesting to share because it also it does a nice job of kind of simplifying some of the concerns and, and on, on both sides of what educational equity can look like. And so this really speaks to you know, the example that when you have incoming kindergartners, if you can imagine a group of incoming kindergartners that had early education opportunities and a group that didn't, it's only logical that you couldn't teach those two same groups of students in the same way. That, that, that just seems to make a ton of sense. However, if we were going with an equality lens, where everything had to be equal for all students, it would not allow teachers or it would not systematically allow the opportunities for differentiation and making sure that those groups of students received what they needed to be successful and to fully participate in our system. We wouldn't want to deny either group the resources and supports that they need to be met where they are. And so that really is sort of where that last sentence on this slide, equity in schools protects the integrity of educating the whole child. Another thing that we were going to do through the DELT was to get the word out there into both the public and into our, our, our school um, staff around equity. And so we've created a page on the district website that includes all of the information that we have collected and presented thus far. And so the right side of the <coughs> screen right now is just sort of a, a screenshot of the opening of that page with a graphic that comes straight from ISBE. This page will continue to grow. In fact, after tonight, tonight's board presentation will be added there as we continue to, to share information. But it really is just meant to be a place to, to look and see. And again, you'll see the very first thing at the top of the page is that statement that we reviewed a couple of slides ago. We've continued as a committee or as an equity leadership team to read and research and, and gain additional background. We, actually, we also continue to, to provide training and professional learning sessions for our staff. In fact, just this afternoon during our Professional Learning Monday, about 175 of our staff members attended a training with Dr. Yvette Dubiel, who continues to work with us. Um, it's part of a, a nine session series. We are up to session four. We go through this with new teachers as they come, as they're onboarded into the district. So today was one group of District 58 staff, and over the next four Mondays, we will have the entire group go through that same training so that we continue to have conversations. In a cursory review of this afternoon's exit slip, the feedback is really overwhelmingly positive from staff about the, the opportunity to reflect and, and continue to think about the ways we can be the best we can be for our students. There are also network opportunities that I don't want to forget to mention as well. DuPage County does a really nice job through the Regional Office of Education of networking um, and providing opportunities for administrative teams. So we participate currently in the curriculum network group, which really has spent a lot of time talking about MTSS, or multi-tiered systems of support, which is another equity lens area of work where we really have to make sure that all students are getting what they need. There's also an equity consortium in DuPage County that we have not fully had an opportunity to participate in this year, but is on our plans for next year to be able to join that and attend some of those meetings um, as well. 
we, as I mentioned, we really did look through every piece of or every section of the equity audit. So one section is the quantitative data. So four years of data wherever we had full sets, obviously recognizing some of this data is pandemic years, and so we just always want to be cautious. But these are um, sort of the, you know, the demographic areas that were, that were pulled and looked at as we went through. So you'll see there's a pretty thorough list on this slide. And then within the audit, the very next slide says these bullet points actually didn't reveal an immediate inequity or something that was needed to be focused on in the findings. And so the, the, the qualification is that doesn't mean there aren't potential equity issues. It just means that there wasn't anything that came through in, that, in the data that we had sent and that the firm had reviewed. And so when you look at that, again, that, that's, that's, a, that's a reassuring piece of the work as to say that an analysis of four or five years of our data didn't necessarily raise equity flags in these areas. Other areas, perhaps, yes, and those are what are part of, of the findings as we go forward. Within the qualitative data, as you'll recall, we invited many, many people to attend focus groups. In all, there were 75 family or community members who attended focus groups, 18 staff members, and 60 students in grades four through eight. And throughout that review, the committee noted um, many affirming comments. Certainly, as we mentioned in November, there are some comments that are, are eager to see even more of a focus on equity. And there were some comments that were unsure of what this work was or what the purpose of it was. Um, the committee really reflected that the recommendations for improvement weren't surprising. It didn't reveal anything that we weren't that wasn't already to some degree on our radar as a district. One great example of that is the past inequity of a paid full day kindergarten program, which we know we ha has been a target for us, and we've already resolved that for the year going forward. There were concerns about the previous social studies curriculum, which have been revised and resolved in new resources. There are there were things mentioned about representation and students seeing or not seeing staff who necessarily look like them. And then there were some, some comments around some of our programs with a neighborhood school model don't exist in every school, such as dual language and gifted, language, excuse me, and gifted and some of those other specialized programs where it's a, a benefit to be able to offer them. It's a reality that in a neighborhood school model, we, they aren't offered in each of our 11 schools by design at this point. And then we also, there was a survey as part of the data, and again, all of the extended survey results are listed in the full audit, which is on the website. This just for tonight's purposes gives us an idea of how many surveys were sent out. You know, the percentage of completed surveys under families looks a little low, but the truth is 400 surveys is, is not a bad number for us. The, the way that the firm did it was we sent almost 9,000 emails with the survey link, so it could be multiple emails per household if multiple household members were listed in our system. So while 5% looks low, 400 is, is actually a pretty typical response rate for many of the surveys we've done. And again, just a few of the comments that, that came through, some things that were, were recognized by the committee as, as we went through that information. Um, the last three bullets just kind of, I, I wanted to pull a question that was similar from each of the survey groups. And again, I think when we look at that and see the amount of, of affirmative responses, which is usually either a strongly agree or agree or something, anything the, the, the other side of neutral, that's really encouraging information and lines up with some other things we see. And yet, I think I would, I would say that even if 1% of our students are saying they're not feeling safe at school, we, we need that just reminds us that we're not, we're not done yet. You know, we may never hit perfection in some of these areas, but this work will be ongoing because I wouldn't, we would not want to be satisfied with anything less than all of our students feeling comfortable and safe in the school environment. So these now are the findings, and this really is where the synthesis of all of that information comes through. So the, the equity audit findings synthesize the, the quantitative data that we sent, the qualitative data from the focus groups, and all of the survey responses as well. And so the larger bullets are the findings that we shared previously in November, and sort of beneath those now on the next couple of, of slides would be where we're at in progress with those things. So again, the first finding of the audit, the first suggestion from the audit was to develop that clear language and communicate it. So we've done that, we've developed that initial statement. Now, you know, that we are, are highlighting things here through board briefs, we will be highlighting that new equity webpage and showing people where that information is. There was a suggestion from the audit that the board produce a policy or a policy, excuse me, or a statement around equity. And I think where the Delta felt comfortable was developing that first. It's a district statement of, of sort of our values around educational equity. We haven't necessarily had a conversation of taking that to the next level. As we've mentioned, there is existing board policy that points toward equity. And so if we can define it as a district, we've, we've taken steps in that direction. 
equity goals. We'll talk a little bit about in a subsequent slide where this may go with strategic planning, but I think obviously we've, we've had, even through the strategic planning workshop, conversations <coughs> about wanting to make sure that equity is a, a tangible thing as, a, as we go into strategic planning. There was a finding around increasing employment recruitment efforts, and so we're, we're, we are beginning down this path. You know, this is an interesting time in education and labor anyway to, to look at recruiting practices, but uh, the additional attending of some job fairs, we've done this right now this year, particularly in search of candidates for EL and dual language positions, and also working towards some additional connections with universities through student teaching programs and just, you know, getting into some of the, the educator pipelines a little bit more fully that might help us to recruit many more candidates in those ways. One of the audit suggestions was to embed opportunities for culturally responsive pedagogy and practices in all curriculum. Whenever we say culturally responsive pedagogy or teaching, I want to be careful that we are differentiating between another CRT acronym and culturally responsive teaching, which are two completely different things. Culturally responsive teaching has been around a long time and really is just a lot of best practices in education that help ensure that no student's background or background knowledge or lack thereof impedes their access to the instructional experience. That really is the, 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 the nuts and bolts of what culturally responsive pedagogy is all about. And so it is a part of our curricular review process and you'll, you'll hear us talk a little bit more about that as we look at the ELA and then the reading series and those kinds of things as well as sort of looking at our social studies adoption and making sure that those resources not, and our instructional strategies are updated regularly to reflect those things. And again, it, it's building an understanding of what those things mean. Even today in the presentation from Dr. Dubiel, there was a list of culturally responsive, or sometimes you'll hear it be as culturally relevant pedagogy. What does that look like in classrooms? And she referenced herself, this isn't new. They're not likely to be strategies that are groundbreaking or earth shattering. They're just the kinds of things we want to keep in mind, again, to ensure that the way we're presenting material and the way we're asking questions ensures access for everyone. There was a, uh, a mention in the audit about accelerating opportunities to gifted programming for students who are either students of color or students serviced in special programming, just based on the discrepancy of students from those backgrounds in our current gifted demographics. And this is actually something that was already on the radar of the gifted committee. In a couple of weeks, you'll hear an update on that program, but I'll, 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 I'll just preview the idea that one of the things we've talked about quite a bit is how do we ensure that our eligibility process is is equitable, is fair, and also is capturing the students that the program is designed to serve in, you know, in all different ways. Right now we look at academic achievement and some teacher rating scales, and we've, th those, are, those are good and common things to do, but we're looking at possibly enhancing or making that a slightly more robust eligibility process, not for next year, but going forward after that. So more to come on that, but just to reference that work is in process, and then I've already talked about the trainings that are going on right now as a result of that. So those are the, the, the findings from the audit that I would say are in process or have been addressed already by the DELT. The other pieces that are in there um, that we would consider addressing a little bit more moving forward from the audit, one is about the disproportionate racial discipline outcomes, and this really focused on suspensions primarily. That was the data that was being looked at. We are working district-wide on aligning our procedures around behavioral support systems for students. In fact, an, a, almost the other half of the district had sessions at their buildings today during the Professional Learning Monday on just that topic and building and reflecting on those systems. So we do want to continue to look at those pieces, but, but step one, or, or a, an important step for us, is ensuring that we have that consistent process in all of our 13 buildings. The other two findings of uh, the audit were around forming a student advisory committee and a community advisory committee. And this really, again, goes into what comes next out of the strategic plan. Because there, you know, when we formed some of these groups, if you think about coming out of the last strategic plan, it, it caused the formation of several councils and committees that did the work of the strategic plan. And so this is kind of where the, the, the next steps for the DELT will align with what does that look like in the plan? Are there going to be specific goals and outcomes where it would make sense to form some of those committees? And would the DELT stay more of as an advisory or an oversight group? Or are those is, is the work of, of equity really going to live 
in many different places where forming one committee to work on it wouldn't necessarily be the right approach, but it's ensuring that that, that, that equity lens is embedded across the board. And so we're kind of in, in a holding pattern for building next year's agendas until we can get a sense of where this work will best live in the district. As always, though, we're going to continue to review our systems and make sure that all of those things that are, that are called for, not just in the findings, but by, by, by best practice, exist. Always a good reminder that when we're talking about equity across 13 neighborhood schools, it means that things sometimes do look different. If we're truly allocating resources based on need in an equitable way, it, it, it will sometimes mean that it, it's not just one per building. Years ago, we hired one reading specialist per building. We know now that, that one reading specialist in a school of 500 and one reading specialist in a school of 300, regardless of even who the students are, is just not the best way to approach that. So that's just a quick example of how our process has already evolved as a result both of strategic planning and just thinking with that equity lens. And then again, continuing our education and implementation. I think the leadership team is, is the, the Delta is thirsty to keep learning and keep discussing and then really finding ways to, to organically and intentionally embed some of those things. And so we actually spent some time at the last meeting talking about the multiple heritage months that exist and how we can use those as a springboard for some intentional focus on different heritages and different demographics and different communities while recognizing recognizing that simply saying we're celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month is not enough, it's not, it, it's not, but it certainly also can be an opportunity for some authentic conversations and some focused opportunities. So next steps are, are embedded in the work and also still kind of um, awaiting the results of strategic planning to make sure we can figure out where we want all of this focus to land. So that's the end of the, my presentation at this point. I'm happy to take questions or comments or anything else from the board. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, questions and comments from the board. Uh, one of the things that uh, jumped out was that approximately one out of eight families don't feel comfortable at their child's school. Uh, and uh, if I like, drive down my block, that means you know two to three houses on my block don't feel comfortable at their child's school. And that, jumps out to me as kind of a aha moment. I'm wondering if we had a chance to look through that data to figure out did that spike at a particular school or with a particular demographic group or something or, or in some other way that we might be able to tease out some of the insights behind that? We have not yet further analyzed that piece, but we certainly can. The other thing that's upcoming is we, we've um, collected the this year's school climate survey, which asks some similar questions. And so you know, we'll be presenting that as part of our June data snapshot. So that might be an opportunity to look at those two surveys similarly. Obviously, one is current year, one is prior year, but to get a sense of you know, what is the, what's the comparison there and what does that look like. Thank you. Did that overlap with any of the pandemic years too? Uh, those numbers? So the survey was filled was was sent out in December of 21. So that would have been still in the midst of yes. I mean that was it's hard. To, it doesn't sound like that long ago, but that was before right. you know February of 22 was all of the mask rulings and all those kinds of things. So, so right. we were certainly in the midst of pandemic learning at that point. Yes, I'm very curious to see now in, in the environment surveys if we we see issues. Because we have similar questions, like you said, right? Great so point. We, we can see if there's a Similar, but not same. Yeah, yeah. But, but certainly that, that the spirit of that question exists in the climate survey, I would. Correct, too. There, there's some research in that realm about why people don't feel comfortable at their kids' school. Sometimes it's localized. Sometimes it has to do with their own school experience when they were a kid, too. Um, we've had some conversations, um, and we're going to continue these conversations at the district, at the leadership team, about asking um, for more demographic data from the people who are filling out the survey. So for instance, if, if we had one group that was telling us they consistently didn't feel welcome in the schools, but all the other groups felt welcome in the school, that might get us some really powerful data rather than just saying what's your child's home school because it doesn't really delineate mm -hmm. the difference there. So that's one of the, the conversations that we're having in terms of if, if the goal here, which we firmly believe it is, or one of the goals is to make all people feel welcome in the school, whether you're a student or whether you're a family, Getting some of that basic demographic information might assist with that. Yeah. That's a good point. Right now, we could compare it at the highest level. In the in the equity survey, we did ask for demographic information. We don't typically, yeah. but as Kev, we were literally just talking about it this morning, it, it certainly could be a part of future surveys where you don't lose your anonymity, but we have an, we have an opportunity to get a little more information about subgroups and responses and things like that. Any other comments or questions? Justin, I just want to thank you and the district equity leadership team for all their work. 
uh, especially in 2023, as you alluded to, this this work can cause controversy on either end of, of the political spectrum. But I appreciate how your team has gone about this and all the hard work that they've done and uh, the board as well. We look forward to having further conversations through the strategic planning process and then continuing this work through. Um, but I think you and your team have done a really nice job um, working through all of this. Thank you. Yes, thank Agreed. You. Thank, thank you. Yes, thank you. All right, that brings us to reports to the board. First up, Superintendent Report, Dr. Russell. Thank you. It's springtime, so there, there's a lot. Uh, so feel free to stop me at any at the end of each uh, section here, and I'm happy to um, you know answer any questions as we go along. I want to thank the Bel Air students, uh, staff, and family members. I know uh, many of them left, but I know Principal Borchelt is here. It's always nice to have the kids and, and to give us an update on, on all the great things that are happening as well as the school improvement goals. So thank you very much for that. In terms of personnel, we are in the middle of student registration uh, for the upcoming school year. The administrative team is working uh, to confirm enrollment and needs for student support. These numbers will allow us to finalize the staffing allocation for next school year. This is also a time when we conduct any necessary reduction in force or honorable dismissals of staff. You will see two resolutions later in the uh, evening. Uh, the lists are made up of part-time and a few full-time teaching positions along with part-time instructional assistant positions. As soon as we confirm staffing needs and identify the specific allocation at each school that will be led by Dr. Uzentis, we plan to rehire the majority, if not all the individuals who are on the honorable dismissal list this evening. This is a nerve-wracking time though for employees that go through that, so I, I do want to recognize uh, that we appreciate all of their hard work and we will work tirelessly to complete this process as soon as possible to then start that rehire process. Um, the list is, is nowhere near as long as it could have been historically, uh, but certainly we recognize um, that we need to move quickly on this because we also don't want to lose um, any of our staff members. In terms of curriculum instruction, the April 4th uh, Teacher Institute Day was another successful day of professional learning for our teachers. Through a combination of outside presenters and uh, presenters from our own districts, teachers, coaches, and administrators, our certified staff members reported an extremely positive experience. Thanks to everyone who prepared the presentations. I also want to thank our B&G staff, uh, led by Kevin Bardo, did a great job with parking. Uh, Justin and the entire team of assistant superintendents really uh, took the lead on the planning, and they did a great job on this as well. This week, we also began IRR testing, which is the mandatory testing uh, for the state of Illinois. Things are generally going very well. Testing will continue over the next two weeks and conclude on April 21st. We're proud of our students for their efforts and positivity. We're grateful for our staff's encouragement of our students and their flexibility as we know their schedules are impacted by state testing. I also want to share how grateful we are for our family partnerships. Our district's participation rate is the absolute highest we've ever seen on the IAR, which is great. Uh, across the district in grades three through eight, we have over 3,000 students and there are only 10 test refusals. And we do have to call them test refusals. That's what the state requires us to do. When you think back uh, a few years ago, uh, that was not the case. And so to only have 10, it really shows that um, we've made significant progress in this area. And also I always say this is a test that, that does test the standards for each grade level. And so having every child participate or close to that really does help us get a gauge on where children are at in terms of the state standards. Do you have any insight into reasoning, yeah. rationale for those times? So I think one of, the, one of the biggest reasons is just our educational push about the impact of these test scores beyond just finding out where your child is at in terms of um, you know, the state standards. We spoke at this at length at Realtor Breakfast, which really talked about the importance of this test because um, during the great school ranking conversations, this is when this came up throughout the community and we did have to you know, really share that. Also, Justin's um, offered the opportunity for PTAs to come and ask questions about this particular test. And so we, we hit it at the local level with each PTA and also talked about the importance of the test taking. Um, and then our building principles. This is the last thing I would say. When people call and ask questions about the test, I'm very grateful to our principals for taking the time to educate families when they have questions about, you know, I don't want my child to take this test. Can you tell me more about it? They really do take the time to explain it to them. So I think that all the above approach has really helped uh, get those numbers down, especially going directly to the PTAs and having those conversations. 
I would just add that if you're if you're getting at why those ten are still mm -hmm. making that decision. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve. I had to. No, that, I apologize. That, that helps. <laughs> but, yeah. but I think there there are some families who were who were advocates for test refusal for many many years, and they have had students in school and still do. And so when I look at the list of who is still who is still part of of the group that are making those choices. The, the vast majority have made those choices consistently as their children have come through our system. Okay. And I guess just one other uh, question related to testing since, since I'm, I'm talking. Um, just the, the timing, right? So we have a window in which we could administer this test. Right. Um, I'm just, you know, it's kind of my own household. Like we came back from spring break and then, you know, kids showed up and they take the test. I guess what sort of um, thought process do we have in terms of right after a break or, or kind of later on? Yeah, so the, and, and I'll let Justin answer the majority of the question, but certainly I've been in this position every year in terms of, you know, when should we take the test? Should we take the majority of it before spring break, the majority of it after uh, spring break? This year, what we really decided to do for the most part was try and take the science assessment beforehand, uh, before break, because that's a quicker assessment where the majority of the IAR would then take place after uh, spring break. We always want to put our students in the best possible position. I think, you know, by doing it after break, it allows them more learning time too, which is always a, a, a good thing. So that's sometimes the argument, give kids as much time as they possibly can um, so they, get, they can get the information because some of the questions on the test, some of that material might be taught after the, the test as well. Um, but really, it does come down a lot to logistics and how much do we think we can reasonably get done before spring break and how much do we think we can get done after spring break but I'll let Justin uh, finish that off. I would agree with all of that and and six years ago we took the state test prior to spring break we always placed it in March there was conversation about you know as we're testing right up to spring break is that optimal is it optimal right after you know there, there's not a perfect answer there the other thing we look at is distance between testing windows so because of our student start date we can't administer the winter map assessment until we get back from winter break and so then just thinking about if we're map testing through most of January, giving ourselves a little bit of space so that we don't have assessment fatigue going into what is the, the, the most challenging and lengthiest assessment is, is kind of also part of the thought process. There's also just something to keeping consistent when, those, when we select those windows. Admittedly, the first week after break had a couple of days off in there and that's not typical, right. um, but, but keeping it, keep, being able to say we've had the IAR after spring break for the past four or five years just, again, gives us more comparable data as we go forward. And it is a, obviously a local decision, so different districts will handle it uh, differently. Um, I think when these tests first ever came out and, and you had the option, I think most districts jumped and did it as soon as possible. Um, the more we learned about this assessment, I think more districts then started to move it back a little bit uh, further and in, in are taking the majority of it uh, after spring break. There certainly isn't a you know perfect answer to this, but I agree with Justin too in terms of that testing fatigue and wanting to make sure that we hit those dates and, and not overload it one way or the other. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. I don't know if Steve Wolf was behind that question, but my, I imagine like having right after our break is tough because you're not back into school mode just yet. Mm -hmm. And do we, have, do we have an opportunity to delay it even further into the school year? And then does that bump up against NWA map testing, which ends up becoming a three week testing period and that's, you know, testing ad nauseum. So, so yes, a little to the latter, that there is certainly that is the closest window we have. And also, we, as Kevin alluded to, we want to give as much learning as we can with that spring map window and yet have time to process the data before the end of the year. The state does identify a finite testing window. And Friday, April 21st is the last allowable day oh, for the it. IAR from the state. So we are taking advantage of going as far out as we can. And I think the, you know, the, the concern is you want to make sure that we leave space and time for makeup assessments as well. And so that's why you know, starting on that Wednesday and Thursday back was, was what, and what did happen in, in, I believe, all of our schools, at least by that Thursday, just to ensure that we have the space to make sure every student can complete. Yeah, that April 21st book kind of helps yes. make some decisions yeah. for us. That retake, making sure that every child gets the opportunity to retake that test, because sometimes what's going to happen is a student will take one of the tests, they get sick, and then if you close that window or butt it up so close that you don't have enough time for makeups, then they're effectively a zero for that assessment, which can really um, artificially deflate the scores. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Let's get back to, uh, now we're on finance. Um, 
not a, a favorite subject of, of most people, but tax bills will be coming out at the end of this month. Uh, the bonds from the referendum will be on this tax bill. During the referendum, the district anticipated an increase in the bond rate of 25 cents. The actual increase for this bill is 23 cents. When we set up the bonds, knowing that the next two years had a higher inflation rate above the growth of assessed values of property, we structured the debt to ensure that the rate would be closer to 23 cents. The total operating rate did increase from last year. This is because the overall EAV, or equalized assessed at value increase, was less than the CPI, which is what limits the district's annual tax levy per the tax cap law. This is the first time since 1992 that under the tax cap, the CPI was 5% or higher. So this is kind of uncharted territory for most districts or for all of our districts that are subject to PTEL. This is also the first operating increase in eight years. The operating rate has dropped every year since 2014. That's that whole pendulum, you know, where the, uh, the rate goes up and the value goes down and vice versa. Um, the total increase from last year to this year would then be 30 cents. 75% is from the bond increase and the other increase is due to inflation in the tax cap legislation. It's also a good time for me to remind the community that DuPage County is under the tax cap legislation. So we are bound, um, we cannot just increase taxes to whatever we want to. It's 5% or the CPI, whichever is less. And then all of the levy information and any recommendations does go through the FAC after lots of consultation with our community leaders. Okay. In terms of technology, I want to compliment James Eichmiller and all of our building secretaries and principals because since sp spring break, the Raptor Visitor Management System has been utilized in all 13 of our District 58 schools, which is a great step in terms of enhancing our security. So again, thank you to all those stakeholders that helped make that happen. As a reminder, Raptor is a modern visitor management system that allows us to better track and identify our visitors. This is part of our ongoing commitment to enhancing school safety that I outlined last week in letters to all families. Student services, we're very proud of the next one. District 58 Special Services Department and the Downers Grove Police Department are presenting an information night on comprehensive safety planning for families of students with special needs. The presentation aims to support families in understanding the DG uh, Police Department's Safe Return Program to support the special safety needs of students with disabilities and other vulnerable community members. The evening will also address how parents can partner with a child's school support team uh, to development and appropriate activities, language, and opportunities for practice. So on Tuesday, April 18th from 7 to 8.30, we'll meet in the Herrick Library with the police department and any uh, families that are interested. We've also communicated this through social media and our normal communication uh, channels. But I want to thank Jessica and her team. It's a very important topic and uh, you know many of our families of students with special needs have expressed interest in something like this and so we want to definitely make sure that we do that for them. Okay, in terms of facilities, uh, we continue uh, to contact various references provided by the top two firms from the interview process uh, for our owner's representative, which is CBRE uh, Heary and Hoffman, Keel and Forge. Both firms have received positive remarks from those served. We're still uh, matching our scope of the work uh, that has been completed with previous references. We hope to bring the final recommendation to the board in May along with the FAC as well. So we are making uh, progress on that and as promised, we'll have something for you um, at the May meeting. All right, I wanna update the board on the elementary school construction schedule. We obviously know the middle schools and when they're going, that will start soon, uh, but I do have uh, an update for the board as promised. And uh, before I spend too much time going through the update, I, I also wanna remind everyone that we do have Bully and Andrews coming back to the board at the May meeting. So we'll have an opportunity to ask them questions at our May meeting and then also White and Company will be back here in the May meeting. When they came during the March meeting, we were showing you the conceptual designs. The May meeting is going to be more of here is our budget estimates year by year. Here's what we think the escalators are going to be. Here's the contingencies, all of that. So we hope to have a building by building update for you as well as the total uh, cost. So it'll be more of a finance presentation, but certainly any questions are fair game when we have those representatives here and that will be at the regular May meeting. So we previously discussed a tentative or draft uh, construction schedule at the March board meeting. As I shared at that time, things were still very tentative and further review was underway. Uh, Bully and Andrews and White and Company have completed their initial review of the elementary school construction phases. Both companies, again, will be at the May meeting uh, to further explain, but I wanted to give you uh, kind of a hint of what you'll see and then we can continue to dialogue about it. 
As part of, this or part of this review, Bully and Andrews and White focused not only on our initial criteria, the age and construction and renovation costs, but expanded it to review years when the additions were built, immediate facility needs, and what we mean by that is if something isn't working in the school, uh, uh, also, recent facility work that may have been completed that might be scheduled for other buildings during the referendum. So for instance, maybe a boiler. And also available existing air conditioned spaces because there are spaces in all of our schools that do have some air conditioning. As an example, Pierce Downer was moved down in the order because of the availability of AC in the new wing. Um, they also just got a new roof and a new boiler system where some of the other schools haven't gotten those updates while Indian Trail was moved up because it didn't have those updates and the open concept wing does make it challenging to put a window unit in there while they were waiting for air conditioning. Uh, further, Billy and Andrews has recognized that there is a need due to logistics to pair two bigger projects at the elementary schools with two smaller projects in the first two summers so the workload is more manageable along with the middle schools. Now that's just not manageable for them but also manageable for us in our B&G team and things like that with our maintenance team. Should be noted that none of our criteria are based on geography, income, or any other political reason. I do have to just be straight with the community. No matter what the order is, somebody's gonna be very happy that they're early and somebody's not gonna be so happy that they're later on. What we have to just make sure is that we continue to be transparent about our thought process, our decision making, and have our uh, experts that we've consulted with and, and hired to be able to give us a solid recommendation. Um, so the following order will take place um, in terms of construction. For phase one, the summer of 24, now the middle schools are going all along with this. You'll have Whittier, Henry Puffer, Hillcrest, and Highland. Phase two would be Fairmount, Kingsley, Leicester and Indian Trail, and we will post all of this by the way. And then phase three would be Pierce Downer, Bel Air, and El Sierra. So I'm going to pause there and ask any questions. I'll read that order one more time. Summer of 24 would be Whittier, Henry Puffer, Hillcrest, and Highland. Summer of 25 would be Fairmount, Kingsley, Leicester, and Indian Trail. And the summer of 26, as it's scheduled now, would be Pierce Downer, Bel Air, and El Sierra. Thomas. You had mentioned that there is a pairing of schools that have bigger projects mm -hmm. and smaller projects. I don't need to get into the specifics of each of those buildings, but help, help me understand what the firms consider big projects and what they consider smaller projects. Yeah, and, and this is just an off-the-cuff estimate, but a bigger project could be somewhere around like the $10, $11 million range, and a smaller project could be around the 5 or $6 million range. When you look at our facilities, we certainly have a difference between some of the larger elementary schools in terms of their size and some of the smaller elementary schools. So for instance, in year one, Whittier and Highland would be considered the two smaller schools. Even though Highland has a lot of students, it's a very simple design uh, to the building. Where Henry Puffer and Hillcrest, given the, the structure of those buildings and how spread out they are and just square footage wise, those would be considered the, the bigger ones. And then the following summer, um, Kingsley and Leicester would be considered the bigger schools, and then Indian Trail and Fairmount would be considered the smaller schools. That's helpful, thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Um, so I, I wasn't here last meeting, but I kind of kept myself updated on what was going on. And um, I, in the prior discussion on this, you know, batching the schools, I kind of made clear that I had an <laughs> issue with the um, referendum being passed on two major items, secure vestibules and air conditioning, and that um, you know, 11 ele elementary schools is a lot to do, but there are projects that can help ensure that the students can get um, some of the benefits of that in each of the classrooms um, for all 11 elementary schools. So my challenge to Bully and Andrews and the team would be um, you know, to look at how can we best um, leverage what we have as far as electrical panel updates early on to ensure that we can have the load to carry um, window units for schools that may not have that benefit um, in, in the following years. And I understand secure vestibules could range depending on what the, what the circumstances of the school are, but to, to look at those two main items um, so that all students can try to get some of the benefits of the referendum as early as possible. And, that, and I think that's a great homework assignment that I'm going to be. We meet with Bully and Andrews and White and Company every Thursday, and so they, these will be two of the questions that we'll put up there. Um, you know, Pierce, if it, if it does, in, in all likelihood, will be in, in that last summer, 
The nice thing is having a third of that building, you know, when I say a third, I'm talking about the new addition, which has two classrooms and then a couple of other rooms, um, but then also the office space already having that air conditioning. It's an easier building to deploy window units in than a place right. like Indian Trail because Indian Trail still has that um, open concept. But I, I do appreciate what you're saying because we cannot guarantee that electrical load. In fact, we have concerns about that electrical load. Yes. So knowing that they may be in the third summer, what can we do now to ensure that they're able to do that? The other thing that we want to do in terms of secured entrances is continue to co have conversations with the, the police department. Is there a way to make those secure while we're waiting for the final referendum uh, project to be done? Again, I'm going to remind everybody, one of the reasons Bully has advocated for this model is to go into a school and be completely done with that school. So you're not coming back all three summers and, and, and all of that. That being said, these are great questions and, and um, you know, Melissa and I had a chance to speak about this and, and so we will be bringing this up with, with Bully and Andrews and White and Company and asking them to sharpen their pencils and see how we can make sure that what we pass the re referendum for, our kids have access to it as soon as possible. Yeah, and I mean, I'm looking at maybe the schools mm -hmm. more in that second summer, like a Lester that's really large, that electrical panel, I'm not sure what that circumstance, you know, I don't know what each of the individual school electrical panels are, but <laughs> I'd imagine that, you know, air conditioning in the individual classrooms is probably a priority as much as we possibly can, um, because I do know that that was, you know, a pretty big item for a lot of our voters mm -hmm. was to get that in there as soon as possible. So the more we can do to try to make that happen and prioritize it. I appreciate that. And just a couple other ones um, in public relations. As of this afternoon, approximately uh, 2,550 students have completed the registration process, and so we're going to continue to advocate uh, for our families to fill that out. We did open it up earlier this year, but we're about halfway there, and so we'll keep going and, and, and keep getting that push out. Um, we're also pleased to report that 53 eighth grade students were notified today that they will be honored with 58 select awards. That's coming up on May 3rd, so we're very happy about that. That will take place at O'Neill. And then I also want to congratulate members uh, Hannes, Doshi, and Olchek on being elected to the board for another four-year term. Uh, we had an uncontested election, uh, but nevertheless, congratulations. Uh, we're very happy to have you continue to serve, and uh, we'll conduct the swearing-in ceremony along with the reconstitution of the board at our May meeting. I look forward to working alongside you and the entire board to help carry out your vision for the district. And last but not least, we have a, a special guest here. I'd like to conclude my remarks by thanking the Pierce Downer Heritage Alliance. Uh, this group has traditionally supported the Lyman Woods experience for our students by presenting a donation to offset the cost of the field trips. One of the greatest things about Downers Grove is our community support. Tonight, we welcome back to the board Mr. Ken Lerner from the Pierce Downer Heritage Alliance to present a donation for this year. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Ken Lerner here on behalf of Pierce Downers Heritage Alliance. Uh, we are a uh, volunteer service group based in Downers Grove uh, to promote environmental and historic preservation. Uh, we have a local focus and we've been serving Downers Grove for over 25 years and uh, part of our mission is promoting environmental education. Uh, and to that end, we're very pleased to have the opportunity to support the Wonder Woods program, uh, which is going to be kicking off starting tomorrow mm -hmm. and continuing for the next several weeks as the kids get a field trip over to Lyman Woods. We're lucky to have Lyman Woods as, as a local resource uh, for educational purposes. It's a high quality nature preserve area right, right on our doorstep. And, uh, and it's, been, uh, it's been very nicely managed by the Park District. Uh, and we're glad to see the collaboration between the Park District and District 58 to utilize this resource uh, for educational purposes for the District 58 students. There's going to be all 11 schools participating uh, of the, the 11 elementary schools and uh, so a total of over 500 students over the next several weeks uh, will get the opportunity to, to see this program. The uh, program combines uh, some uh, hands-on you know, classroom style instruction at the Lyman Woods Interpretive Center and along with the field trip where they actually go out in the woods and, and get to experience some of the different uh, um, ecosystems that they have there. They have, uh, you know, glacial hills, woodlands, uh, wetlands, and there's an opportunity to, to, uh, to see firsthand uh, some of the features of the, of the natural assets there and, and uh, probably spring wildflowers are coming out just about now. 
and uh, with luck they might even see a little fun uh, as well. <laughs> and uh, so it, you know, get, gives the kids a chance to go out and see some nature. It takes the, the uh, you know, the, the, the state science curriculum, the, you know, and standards and uh, flushes out those objectives and, and, uh, and goals in a, in a, a, a uh, you know, it, it livens them up in a literal way, <laughs> getting a chan chance to, for the students to see some nature up close and personal. So uh, we, uh, we appreciate this, uh, this great effort. It's been going on for, for years and years, and recently, in the last couple of years, expanded to a full day program so they really can get out and see some more of the woods. And uh, we are pleased to support that with, uh, in a tangible way with a donation for $900 which will off, help offset some of the expenses associated with the program. And uh, so we're happy to do it. We express our appreciation to the uh, staff, teachers, parents that help make the program happen. And uh, we uh, will hope you will check our organization out at www.pdha.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you for appreciate continued it. support. We appreciate it. And just as a reminder, during the pandemic, no children lost this field trip because last year we had all first through third graders go. So the second and third graders last year who would have missed it. And so we really appreciated the extra support last year as well. Thank you. I was able to go on a second grade trip there with the kids. And it, it's pretty amazing, yeah. everyone. It's, I mean, they got to put on waders and they hunted for bugs. And it was a really special experience for the kids. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. We hope it's one day for the kids, but we hope that it will lead to a lasting appreciation and curiosity about nature. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And that concludes my report. Wonderful. Any other questions or comments for Dr. Russell? Thank All right. Um, then we're going to bring up Todd Drayfall for the monthly business report and the treasurer's report. We're looking for backup over there or what? <laughs> Since we have a, a, a session up in two weeks, I'll, I'll be brief uh, okay. this evening. Uh, you have a year-to-date report. Things are moving along. We will, uh, I think we've mentioned this before, um, at the May board meeting, you'll have an amended budget um, to put on display for 30 days uh, and then approval in June for the amended fiscal year 23. Uh, due to uh, the bond sale and, and so forth. So we'll be making some adjustments um, along the way to kind of clean up expenses that have adjusted uh, from our initial plan set way back last summer, uh, as well as uh, marking some of the increase in revenues uh, that you've seen. Uh, certainly the interest uh, income level has um, gone up uh, significantly since that time. So that's your year to date report. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the, the workshop in, in, in just a minute. What you have on your agenda uh, for action items is it's spring, and so you have bids uh, for next year's supplies uh, on, on this, this month, and you'll have some more next month uh, as those are coming into the season for uh, art supplies and, and paper and so forth. Uh, you also have on there our fourth year of the Rexnard abatement. Um, Rexnard is an aerospace uh, manufacturer that has a facility here in Downers Grove. Uh, District 58 and District 99 both agreed in 2017 uh, to abate a portion of taxes on the new addition, uh, provided that um, that facility maintained a certain level of income or salaries for positions and so forth. Uh, they've certified that uh, that is adjusted. And so we're down to a 60% abatement uh, starting at 100 and going down to zero. So uh, this is the fourth year, and we continue on through that piece. And Todd, real quick, Rexnard, the facility is along Curtis Street by the Belmont uh, train station across uh, the street. And, and I think they doubled the size of the facility or something very yeah, significant. It was a significant with, with increase in it's and right a big down. modernization of their yes. facilities yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, and it's continually operated and, and moving forward. So that's, that's always, it's always good to hear. Uh, so what you'll have in a few weeks is, uh, this is an exciting piece. 
it adds some complication because we're looking at, you know, two in this financial planning process, just as to remind the board and the community, um, District 58 uses a five-year planning every year uh, plan update so that when we're looking to the next fiscal year, fiscal year 24, uh, we are looking at programs and how we're going to maintain and sustain uh, programs over the term and what our resource that we predict to come in um, and where our revenue or and where we, we expect expenditures to be at. Uh, that will be part of you know, the continual process. We do that and we'll have that presentation at the workshop and then follow through with uh, and ask for a board approval of that plan in May. Um, it very much solidifies what the, the final budget uh, will come to the board uh, in the summer uh, for initial review in August and, and final in, in uh, um, September. Um, at that point, we're cleaning up and making all of the, we, we have a better sense of re the resources at that point from what the state is going to give us from an estimate to a hard number uh, and a little more uh, accurate view of, of things. Um, into that planning process, we certainly would take into account um, the fund balance policy that the board has approved. Uh, we are also taking into account and looking forward to a capital planning process once bonds, uh, once we, you know, we have finished and completed uh, the next four years of construction and the referendum bonds uh, that we are now working with. Uh, and what that will, will do, and we've talked about that at, both here at the board and at the FAC, but we will put that into place. We also put into the plan, um, we built in technology uh, planning and curriculum updates that were not previously in there, so we continually maintain and, and make sure that we're, we know those things are coming and when they're gonna come. Um, there is one positive, I will add that there's a compli there, that it gets complicated because of the, the capital piece because it adds an, another level, but that also helps out in some areas because there are things that are going to be part of the capital planning process, particularly talk about technology with E-rate funding and wiring and, and a lot of things that will happen as part of that construction piece that will give some relief to our annual operating. Uh, so that technology can look at and focus and do some things that um, it doesn't have to maintain and worry about some of the wiring and cabling and, and updates uh, that would otherwise have to happen. Uh, likewise in the operation and maintenance area because there's going to be some relief in those areas. Not that they won't, you know, eventually, think, you know, because things go on to warranty and so forth. Um, so that will be what is coming uh, to the board in a couple weeks. Um, we will also take into account, obviously, the, the approval already of the full day kindergarten and all of those processes. We've been working through with the document continuously since January. Uh, what you're going to see is, is where we're at um, as we build in uh, what, what we see as the new resources coming in and how uh, we anticipate those, those expenditures. So that is to, that's our little Garrett, for those who want to watch it online, want to come in and, and watch the, the workshop, uh, and then for the board uh, that we'll have in two weeks. Other than that, if there are any questions. Questions, comments from the board? Wonderful. Thank, Thank, you, Thank you very you. much. All right, the policy committee has not met since the last board meeting, neither did the legislative committee. The financial advisory committee has not met. The district leadership team has not met and neither has the Health and Wellness Committee. So that brings us to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but it is not intended to be a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Um, I have allotted 30 minutes tonight for public comment. We ask that you keep your comments to three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity to speak. I didn't see anyone bring you a card. Um, is there anyone here that would like to make a public comment tonight? All right, then we will move on to the approval of minutes. Are there any suggested revisions to the minutes as presented in the packet of materials? So moved. Second. No, no, I'm just a revision. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
Just any revision right now. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes from the March 13th, 2023 regular meeting as presented? So moved. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried to approve the minutes of the March 13th, 2023 regular meeting as presented. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the March 20th, 2023 strategic planning workshop as presented? So moved. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion carried to approve the minutes of the March 20th, 2023 Strategic Planning Workshop as presented. Um, no, I abstain from the regular meeting minutes. Just oh, that's fine. Just yeah. An option, I'm sure. Um, yeah, we got you. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Are there any items, uh, we have a consent agenda. Are there any items a board member would like to have considered separately? All right. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda consisting of the personnel report and financial statements consisting of the list of bills and summary? So moved. Second. All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye, the motion carried to the consent, the consent agenda has been approved as presented in the packet of materials. All right, uh, we have some recommendations for action. First one up is the honorable dismissal of teachers. Pursuant to section 24-12 of the Student Code of Illinois, um, 105 ILCS 524-12, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Downers Grove Grade School District 58, DuPage County, Illinois, that the teachers listed in the resolution attached under item 14A of tonight's agenda, posted on board docs, shall be honorably dismissed at the end of the 2022 through 2023 school year because of the decision of the board to decrease the number of teachers employed. So moved. Yeah, second. All right, any discussion? I just like to recognize um, that the, the work that was done to change our paradigm, where, whereas we in the past we had a, a last and first out model with our certified staff, and now we've uh, taken the opportunity of, of um, Senate Bill 7 and the opportunities afforded to us there to um, change that. I mean, it's, whereas it's, it's more complex, but whereas we're not doing that exactly that same way that we used to be. So it's not exactly last in, first out. And I, that's been important to me. Thank you to doctors, Russell and Udentis, and uh, to the DGEA and to the evaluators and everybody who got that going. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution regarding the honorable dismissal of teachers. Next up is the honorable dismissal of part-time educational support staff. Pursuant to, sec to section 10-23.5 of the Student Code of Illinois, of Illinois, that's 105 ILCS 510-23.5, be it resolved that the Board of Education of Downers Grove Grade School District Number 58, DuPage County, Illinois, that the part-time educational support personnel employees listed in the resolution attached under Item 14B on tonight's agenda posted on board docs shall be honorably dismissed and not reemployed for the 20 for the 2022 through 2023 school term because of the decision of the board to decrease the number of part-time educational support personnel employees employed. At this time I entertain the motion to adopt the resolution regarding honorable dismissal of part-time educational support personnel employees. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion? Since this is the last year term should be 23 24. Yes. Okay, so yeah. that's We're all fine. Cool. Okay. Thank you for that. I was just going to. That's why I paused yeah. there. No, I you're good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 yeah, the resolution is 23 24, just to be clear. Anything else? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution regarding the honorable dismissal of part-time educational support personnel employees. Uh, C. Resolution ratifying the proposed amendments to the School Association for Special Education in DuPage Articles of Joint Agreement. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution ratifying the proposed amendments uh, to the Sasset Articles of the Joint Agreement? Need a motion. So moved. Second. All right, discussion. Yeah, I know we talked about this a little bit last time, so. All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. 
Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution ratifying proposed amendments to the SASID Articles of Joint Agreement. All right. Inter next up is Intergovernmental Cooperation Agreement for Mutual Assistance in Response to Crisis in Public Schools of DuPage County. Is there a motion to approve the Intergovernmental Co Cooperation Agreement for Mutual Assistance in Response to Crisis in the Public Schools of DuPage County substantially um, in the form of presented by the superintendent and to authorize the president and secretary to sign the agreement. So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? So remember, this is what uh, Dr. Russell was talking about in his uh, update in last month's meeting. All right. Yep. Let's please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the Intergovernmental Cooperation Agreement for Mutual Assistance in Response to Crisis in the Public Schools of DuPage County substantially in the form presented by the Superintendent and to authorize the President and Secretary to sign that agreement. Uh, next up is the Rexnard Property Tax Abatement. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing property tax abatement for the Rexnard facility for the 2022 tax year? So moved. Second. All right. Any discussion? There's a couple of things I just wanted to, yeah. we were talking about this earlier tonight, um, and, and please, Darren, since you were here, or um, correct me if I'm wrong, but two things I wanted to point out. One is, um, when the decision was made, um, the, I want to make sure I phrase this correctly. So the, we, never, we never took less money from that parcel of land, because when we, when we uh, the abatement was, was structured so that we would always get um, more money each year, but we never took less money. So we were never, it was never a gift to Rex and I, it was just that they made a huge investment. The, the equalized assessed valuation of that, of that parcel land went up considerably. So we were always, we're, we've been getting a steadily increasing amount of taxes each time, and we never gave away tax money to, to Rexnard. And the other point I just wanted to say in terms of like, you know, these kinds of abatements can be controversial. It gets kind of like a uh, crony corporatism. Um, there was a feeling at the time that they would not have invested in our community and they would have uprooted and taken, them, taken themselves and jobs with them if we didn't agree to this. So at the time, this was you know just a big win-win for everybody, and um, so we it, we are now. This is history uh, uh, for 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 this board. It's something that happened a long time ago, but it's, I just worth. I think it's just worth to refresh our memory on, on why we did this and why it was good for the district, and good for 99 as well, and good for the community as, at whole, as as a whole. And while I wasn't superintendent when this was approved, every bit of research and every conversation I've had with the Downers Grove Economic Development Corporation, the village, and Rexnard officials mirrors what you just shared so i would uh, concur with everything that you shared and i actually think that this was a very creative solution not to lose uh, uh anchor company like that in our community and really preserve it for the long run and, and preserve the jobs here granted that's never the job of a, of a school district uh, that being said um i also think this was a very creative solution to a lot of times when you see abatements for corporations or that there are four 20 years or, or for, this was a way to keep this um, business here in Downers Grove with the, the high salaries and then gradually get them um, you know to that 100% level so I, I agree with everything that you said and, and I actually will go further though and say that I think it, it's a creative solution one that I hadn't seen before I came to Downers Grove uh, and uh, Rexnard you know really says that this is the reason they're here mm -hmm. Uh, Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution authorizing property tax abatement for the Rexnard facility for the 2022 tax year. We have surplus equipment to get rid of. Um, is there a motion to designate as surplus equipment one electric stove, three computer charging carts, uh, 1,500 Dell Chromebooks, and 23 Mac Minis? Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to designate as surplus equipment one electric stove, three computer charging carts, 1,500 Dell Chromebooks, and 23 Mac Minis. 
Next up, is there a motion to approve the purchase of 393 wireless access points, two Cisco 24 port switches, and associated equipment and coverage for a price of $242,342.11 from CDWG? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. And Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the purchase of 393 wireless access points to Cisco 24 port switches and associated equipment and coverage for a price of $242,342.11 from CDWG. Uh, next up, technology and food service consultants for capital projects. Is there a motion to approve the consult, uh, consultant firms for food service and technology as recommended by White and Company? So moved. Second. All right. Is there any discussion on this? Okay. Melissa, please go roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to approve the consultant firms for food service and technology as recommended by White and Company. We have a bid for paper for the 23-24 school year. Is there a motion to award the bid for paper for the 2023 through 2024 to Mernane for an estimated cost of $64,712? So moved. Second. All right, any discussion on that? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the bid for paper for the 2023 through 2024 to Renane for a estimated cost of $64,712. We have a bid for general supplies for the 2023 through 2024 school year. Is there a motion to award the bid for general supplies for 2023 through 2024 to Runco for an estimated cost of $26,234 and two cents? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Joshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the bid for general supplies for 2023 through 2024 to Runco for an estimated cost of $26,234.02. Last step is a bid for art supplies for the 2023 through 2024 school year. Is there a motion to award the bid for art supplies for the 2023 through 2024 school year to, uh, to school specialty for an estimated cost of $24,865.43? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Melissa, please call roll. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Doshi. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchik. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to award the bid for art supplies for the 2023 through 2024 school year to school specialty for an estimated cost of $24,865.43. All right. A couple of announcements. On Tuesday, April 14th at 7 a.m., there will be a policy committee meeting at the O'Neill Middle School. It's April 18th. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. April 18th at 7 a.m., the policy committee meets at O'Neill Middle School. Uh, Monday, April 24th at 7 p.m. will be the budget and financial planning workshop. That will take place at O'Neill Middle School as well. And then Monday, May 8th at 7 p.m. will be our next regular board meeting. The board will now meet in closed session. Is there a motion to, to move to closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees of the district? That's 5 ILCS 122C1. All of them. And then the discussion of minutes of meetings lawfully closed under the Open Meetings Act, whether for the purposes of approval by the body of the minutes or the semi-annual review of minutes, as mandated by Section 2.06, that's 5 ILCS 122C21. So moved. Second. All right, any discussion on that? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, the motion carried. The board will now move into closed session after a short recess. It's 827. Let's meet at 830.